So during this lecture, we're going to talk about the reservoir modeling theory that's used in RMCRFA. We're going to explore methods for developing a reservoir model, and we're going to demonstrate how to enter that information into RMCRFA. Okay, so what is a reservoir model? A reservoir model is used to determine pool stages and discharges by routing a flood hydrograph through the reservoir pool and the outlets. The reservoir routing model includes characteristics of the reservoir, such as the stage storage relationship and information about the physical structures, like any spillways or outlets that you have at your dam. RMC RFA is based on level pool routing um, and the continuity equation, which is discussed on the next slide, the reservoir model is used to calculate peak stages for the stage frequency curve. Reservoir routing in RMC RFA is based on the level pool routing method, where the inflow minus the outflow is equal to the change in storage. Specifically, RMC RFA uses a finite difference approximation of the continuity equation called the modified pools routing method. Inputs to an RFA reservoir model include a stage storage discharge relationship, okay. The reservoir routing capability in RMC RFA uses a simplified approach, as I mentioned earlier, with a single stage storage discharge curve. Complex reservoir models such as those that include downstream controls or rule curves for gated spillways are typically not needed for projects because we're modeling extreme floods. The reason complex reservoir operations aren't typically required is because the surcharge operating schedule and maximum discharge capacity typically dominate peak stages for extreme flood events. From for small to medium floods, discharges in the reservoir model can be adjusted to calibrate to the observed peak stages. So we'll talk about that a little bit more on a future slides. There are four steps to entering a reservoir model into RMC RFA. The first step is to enter a name and a description. The second step is to enter the reservoir data into the table. And so those three pieces of information are stage, storage, and discharge. Storage and discharge values must always increase with increasing stage. So that's a, uh, you can't have the same value repeated in the table. It must increase. So you can play some games with that if you want to. And, you know, add some decimal places or something if you need to have something um, a certain way. But you'll get the you'll get the hang of it today when we work through this some exercises. Um, the third step is to enter the reservoir features. So it won't let you save a reservoir model unless you do this. And sometimes, even though I've done this a lot of times, I forget to like go to the next tab and enter these in. And then I'm like, why won't it save? And this is the reason, because you need to enter these three pieces of information. So it's going to ask you for the elevation for the top of dam, for the spillway crest, and then for the IDF, the inflow design flood. And recall, I mentioned earlier that you can choose to put in your PMF there for the IDF, or you can put in your spillway design flood, or whatever flood you happen to have that's the largest flood that um, you know about for your basin. Um, and it's just going to plot those as horizontal lines. That's why it's asking for that information. Once all of this information has been entered, you should review the plots to verify they're correct. The default plot in the reservoir model is the stage storage relationship. And a lot of people don't realize that you can right click within the plot and you can switch it then to the stage discharge plot. So it, they're both in there and it, I would really strongly encourage you to look at them and make sure that they make sense. Because um, this is going to determine a lot of how your output ends up looking at the end of the model. Um, once you verify that the inputs are correct, you have completed the input of the reservoir model. More than one re reservoir model can be created within a project, allowing the user to evaluate different operating assumptions and scenarios. For example, the user might want to create separate reservoir models with and without the use of regulating outlets to check the sensitivity of peak stages for scenarios when regulating gates are operable and inoperable. So I'll give you an example. So let's say we have a dam that has 18 gates. We might want to, for the risk analysis, we may want to evaluate a situation in which half of those gates don't operate for some reason. Maybe you're in a cold climate and they freeze closed and they can't be opened. Or maybe they haven't been operated regularly and they don't function. Or maybe you lose power to your powerhouse because there's flooding and 
you can't get a generator up there for some reason, and then you can't open the gates. So we often run this type of scenario to help inform the risk analysis. Um, and rather than doing every single gate, you know, what if, what if 17 fail? What if 16 fail? Rather than doing that, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll do um, like 25, 50, 75%, 100% fail. And what, I mean, as you would expect, what happens is that when you lose some of your gates, you're going to overtop more quickly um, than you would if the gates were functioning, if you have a gated dam. So um, anyway, okay. Reservoir storage curves and discharge rating curves can typically be found in water management documents and design documents. Most projects have rating curves for spillways, both either gated or ungated, and also outlet works. So that we call those um, the sluice, sluice gates and low flow outlets, we call that the outlet works. So um, it's very common um, for us to assume that the outlet works are not working for large floods. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when you're developing all of the different things that could discharge, like your spillway and all of your outlets, and maybe there's multiple um, types of spillways that you're, maybe there's an auxiliary spillway and a main spillway, and you might even, you definitely are going to want to also think about overtopping um, and add that into your assumptions here. Um, so a lot of times we just use a simple weir equation um, and you can get as detailed as you want to on what that looks like. And then also think about sometimes um, there are additional appurtenant structures that are part of the high ground for the dam. So you might have your main embankment and then you might also have like three rim dikes or you might have an auxiliary dam that's in addition to the main dam. So you need to make sure that you're including all of the discharge that could possibly be flowing out of your dam. So those would all be things you want to consider for overtopping. Um, okay, the stage versus storage relationship, also referred to as the stage storage function, relates water surface elevation to the volume of water stored. It provides a geometric description of the reservoir that is used during the routing to determine the rise and fall of the water surface elevation, given a change in the volume of the stored water. In most cases, a stage storage curve will be provided in the water management manuals or design reports. In some cases, stage area relationship is available, which can be used to develop the stage storage relationship. It's important that the stage increments in the stage storage function are such that the critical reservoir elevations, such as the spillway and top of dam, are adequately captured. Sometimes these curves don't go all the way up to the top of dam, and you may have to extrapolate. So we'll talk about that more in another lecture. Um, so that's really important to capture. The stage storage curve typically needs to be extrapolated above the top of dam to model potential overtopping events. RMC RFA does not extrapolate the curve during a simulation. So you will need to, it'll just flatline at whatever your top, um, whatever your top elevation is. So you need to make sure that you're considering that. A stage storage curve can be extrapolated using a terrain data set, such as a digital elevation model from the national elevation data set. This can be done using GIS software or tools available that are in HEC RAS. The highest known stage and storage value can be used as a starting point and then incrementally increase uh, the storage. And you can calculate that for higher elevations um, and then add that to the starting value. The stage storage discharge function must be monotomically increasing, which means that both storage and discharge must increase with increasing values of stage. So I mentioned that earlier. Um, Okay, the stage versus discharge relationship, also referred to as the stage discharge function, relates the water surface elevation to the total discharge. Stage discharge information can typically be found in the water management documents. This, um, the stage discharge relationship should include the total releases. So I already mentioned this, but I'll say it again. So you wanna include your outlet works, your spillways, your powerhouse, if there is one, any overtopping, and any other discharge facility that might be present at your dam. So you make sure everything is accounted for. Overtopping stages, storage, and discharges should be included in the relationship in order to properly model extreme flood events that result in overtopping. For additional details on stage storage discharge, you can refer to the RMC guidance document that I mentioned earlier in an inflow volume-based approach to estimating stage frequency curves for dams. Typical flood control dams are operated with consideration for downstream constraints to minimize flood damages. A dam might be operated in conjunction with other dams as well, which further complicates the releases. 
So you're gonna wanna check very carefully with your water management procedures and re review the guide curves and evaluate operations during previous flood events. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, and talk with dam operators to assess how the dam is likely to be operated during flood events. Important questions to ask include things like, are, there, are the operating rules clear? Is there an emergency release schedule? When the spillway gauges are operating, sorry, when are the spillway gates opened? Do they open right away? Do they hold the water for a while? Do regulating outlets remain open or are they closed? And every project's gonna be unique, so you do kind of need to research it for every single project that you work on. For flood control dams, we typically don't want to enter the maximum discharge capacity. So keep that in mind, that's really important. So a lot, you know, a lot of times we'll look at that curve and we'll just slap that right in. Um, but that is a lot of water to assume that you're discharging. So you need to think about what would actually happen in the real operations of the dam. And there's a lot of rules usually associated with making those decisions. Um, so you're gonna wanna research what specifically is required by the operating rules in the design documentation. Um, the dam will likely not be operated at the maximum discharge capacity, especially early and middle in the middle stages of a flood event. The releases during this time are typically kept to a minimum to minimize downstream flooding. So if you put in full capacity, you're gonna be assuming that, you can re that you're releasing a lot more water than is probably reasonable. Only when reservoir stage uh, begins to approach and exceed the top of flood control pool is that's typically when we're gonna start increasing significantly um, the discharge according to our emergency release schedule. The published stage discharge should always be checked. The curve will typically need to be extrapolated above the top of dam to model potential overtopping events. Appropriate methods to calculate and extrapolate the stage discharge rating curve can be found in Engineering Manual 110-2-1603 and Engineering Manual 110-2-1605. When extrapolating a stage discharge curve for a gated spillway, be sure to consider that the spillway gates will typically transition to an orifice flow condition above the design pool elevation. This limits the discharge capacity. So this is another time when, again, if you just put full capacity in your assumption, that's probably not a good realistic assumption for your model. This limits the discharge capacity when it goes into that orifice flow condition. Extrapolating the curve, assuming free uncontrolled flow, will typically overestimate the discharge, resulting in an unconservative stage frequency curve. We do not want that. The plot on the left shows a validation and extrapolation for an uncontrolled spillway using the simple Weir equation. So you can kind of see here, oh, yes. And I finally remember to use my pointer. So you can see, it's a little maybe hard to see on the projector slide, but um, there's a solid line underneath it that goes up to a certain elevation. And then we've, that dotted line extrapolates beyond using just the Weir equation for that ungated um, spillway. And then, and perhaps it was an OG Weir, or perhaps it was another kind of Weir, um, broad crested Weir or something, but we use the correct Weir equation for whatever is actually physically present at the dam. And then the second one is the gated spillway. And notice the difference between the green and the blue curves. Um, one is considering orifice flow and the other is considering full capacity flow, free flow. And as you can see, they're quite different at, different at the elevations. There's a large difference in the amount of discharge that's assumed. So if you were to assume the green curve for a full capacity curve, you would be very much overestimating the amount of flow that you would be letting out during those stages in the, in the gated pool. It's important that the stage storage discharge function is extrapolated beyond, I think I said this like five times, um, above the top of dam to include overtopping discharge estimates. A simple way to develop an overtopping discharge rating is to apply the Weir equation based on the top of dam elevation and the length of the dam crest. So that's the simplest way to do it. If you want, you can use um, a terrain model and use RAS or something to try and get a little closer to what that number is. Um, if the dam crest elevation is not reasonably consistent over the crest length, or if there are different dam sections with different elevations, then you can divide the crest into segments and calculate the discharge rating for each of those segments. 
The total overtopping discharge can then be calculated by summing up all those segments. An alternative method, and I already mentioned this, is to use a hydraulic model such as HECRAS to calculate an overtopping discharge rating curve based on the Crest survey of the dam. The final stage storage discharge curve entered into RFA represents the total discharge that should be calculated as the sum of the regulating outlets, the spillway, and overtopping discharges. Each dam is different, with some projects having multiple regulating outlets and spillways. It's important to consider that you should include all sources of discharge that might come into play during flood events and how it might be operated. Okay, to summarize, let's take a quick look at how RFA is going to bring all of the inputs, analyses, and reservoir model together for a simulation. Remember that RFA follows an inflow volume-based stochastic framework. First, RFA will sample an inflow volume frequency curve. Remember, that's the thing that's coming from best fit. And it's going to sample that curve that's based on the distribution parameters and the effective record length. Next, RFA will sample an inflow hydrograph shape and scale the inflow hydrograph to match the sampled volume. Then the flood seasonality will be used to sample a month for the flood event. The starting stage will be sampled based on the month of the flood and the corresponding starting stage duration curve. Now that RFA has generated an inflow hydrograph and a starting stage, the event can be routed through the dam using the reservoir model, which is the topic of this lecture, um, to obtain the estimate of the peak stage. This process is repeated many, many times to generate many sample to flood events and many calculated peak stages. These peak stages are then used to develop the final stage frequency curve with uncertainty. And you can see that the, um, the graphic is very similar to best fit in that it's shaded in the, in the 90 percent confidence interval between the 95th upper and the 5th percent lower uh, confidence limits.